Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering substance abuse disorders. Um, you're going to love this video, so please go ahead, press that like button now, subscribe to this channel if you haven't done so already, and don't forget, I have audio lessons available for you on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Now, before we get started, I always like to start off my video with a prayer. If you're not into that, that's fine. Just fast forward. If you are, just close your eyes, bow your head. Father God, thank you, Lord. Thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you for this opportunity to go over this information, Father God. Lord, I ask that every single piece of, piece of information that's being discussed in this video, Jesus, I pray that you help every single viewer to understand this information, process this information, Father God, and be able to think critically through this information when they see the same content again, that they can be able to answer um, these questions correctly. Thank you for the grace that you've given us. Thank you for the favor um, you've poured over our lives, over the lives of our children, over the lives of the people who love and support us. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. We praise your name and we give you all the glory. In Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. All right, guys, let's get started. First question. A patient with a history of alcohol abuse is admitted to the hospital following an auto automobile accident. What is the most what is most important for the nurse to assess to plan care for the patient? A, when the patient last had alcohol intake. B, how much alcohol has recently been used? C, what type of alcohol has re recently been ingested? Or D, the patient's current blood alcohol concentration. And guys, by the way, this is a famous test question. You have to understand this concept. You're not gonna get the same exact question, but the concept behind this question, yes, the chances of you getting this is very high. The correct answer is A, when the patient last had alcohol intake. And here's why. Alcohol withdrawal has a possibility of being what? Lethal deadly. So it's very important for us to know when's the last time this patient had an alcoholic drink because um, alcohol withdrawal has to be monitored closely. That's number one. And number two, if this patient has to go into surgery, we need to know if they've had alcohol recently because we know that with alcohol increases the risk of what? Bleeding and post-op. What are our three biggest concern? Infection, DVT or PE, and what? hemorrhage bleeding out so a is the correct answer for all the reasons that i just gave you and here's a clue if you go back to the question they tell you history of alcohol abuse so whenever you get a test question they go out of their way to tell you that this patient has a history of alcohol abuse and something has happened one of the first things you need to be thinking about is alcohol withdrawal you need to be thinking about the possibility of them hemorrhaging you need to be thinking about um thiamine deficiency okay so those are like the three things you really need to be thinking about the minute that they even mentioned that this patient has alcohol addiction problem so um a is the correct answer b c and d all of these are um, important things important information to get but it's not going to be our priority whenever you get a test question asking you about priority you need to think to yourself because priority is going to be what either keeps the patient al alive the longest or can kill them the fastest. So you need to be thinking in terms of that. And when it comes to these these choices that were given to us, what's deadliest out of, of these four choices? The alcohol withdrawal, then bleeding out. So that's why A is the correct answer. Not that B, C, and D are not important. Yes, they are, but they don't take precedence over that um, answer choice of A, finding out when's the last time that they had alcohol. Because remember, if, they're, uh, if they abuse alcohol, now they're in the facility, which means they're not getting any alcohol. We're concerned about what? Withdrawal is the correct answer. Next question. A patient in alcohol withdrawal has a nursing diagnosis of ineffective protection related to sensory motor defects, seizure activity, and confusion. Which nursing intervention is most important for the nurse? Excuse me, which nursing in intervention is most important for the patient? A, provide a dark and quiet environment free of external stimuli. B, force fluids to assist diluting the alcohol concentration in the blood. C, monitor vital signs frequently to detect an extreme autonomic nervous system response. Or D, use restraints as necessary to prevent the patient from reacting violently to hallucinations. 
And guys, the correct answer is C, monitoring their vital signs frequently to detect an extreme autonomic nervous system response. Guess what? That extreme autonomic nervous system response that the patient can have during alcohol withdrawal, that's what makes alcohol withdrawal so deadly. So absolutely, we're going to be looking at that blood pressure. We're going to be looking at that heart rate. C is the correct answer because it is life-threatening. We're concerned about that patient having a seizure, having a stroke, having tachycardia to the point that it throws that patient into a dysrhythmia. That is going to take precedence whenever you are questioned about priority. Always ask yourself, what can kill my patient the fastest or keep them alive the longest? That's going to be your priority. Let's look at the wrong answer choices before I move on. Look how A tried to trick you. And test writers do this all the time. They'll give you a beautiful answer, but they'll mix in a wrong answer. And let me tell you something, for testing purposes, if the entire answer, that means 100% of that answer, if it's not correct, it's wrong. So as much as you want to choose that answer because there's a part in it that's correct, if one part is incorrect, it's wrong, get rid of it. Look at choice A. It says, provide a darkened, quiet environment free from external stimuli. Well, guess what? That quiet environment, that's the good part. That's correct, right? We don't need any loud noises. The patient's already at risk for seizures, psychosis, you name it, right? That quiet environment, yes, but darkened environment? Remember, this patient is at risk for psychosis, safety is going to be an issue. Do we really want that environment dark where they can mis, um, perceive their environment? Absolutely not. The environment, it needs to be well lit. This is a safety issue, but quiet. So that's why number one uh, letter A is wrong. B, force fluids. No, we don't want to force fluids. We, you want to throw your patient into a dysrhythmia? They're already at risk for dysrhythmia, so we're not gonna force fluids, absolutely not. Choice uh, D, use restraints as necessary to prevent the patient from um, reacting violently to hallucinations. Guys, restraints are our last option. We only use restraints when we have no choice. Now in this uh, situation where this patient may be going through alcohol withdrawal, they're already at risk physiologically speaking, do we really want them fighting against um, um, those restraints and putting their body through exhaustion? No. So the correct answer, what's most important is um, choice C, watching those vital signs and um, detecting early any signs and symptoms of, and look at that word they put in front of it. They didn't did just say autonomic nervous system response extreme as in severe remember i told you those keywords when you see them that's your priority that's who you're running to right so c is the correct answer next question what is an important post-operative intervention indicated for alcohol for the alcoholic patient who is an alcohol intoxicated and is undergoing emergency surgery let me read that again because I feel like I read it wrong. What is an important post-operative intervention indicated for the alcoholic patient who is alcohol intoxicated and is undergoing emergency surgery? A, monitor weight because of malnutrition. B, give an emergency dose of magnesium. C, decrease pain medication to prevent cross tolerance to opioids. Opiates. Did I pronounce that right? You know what I mean, opioids. D, closely monitor for signs of withdrawal and respiratory cardiac problems. Now, with what I said before, us looking for the priority, us looking for something that would kill the patient the fastest or keep them alive the longest, what would you choose, guys? I hope you chose D. Closely monitor for signs of withdrawal and respiratory and cardiac problems. Why? We want to prevent respiratory and circulatory failure. Think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. When it comes to physiological integrity, when it comes to the thing that can kill the patient the fastest or keep them alive the longest, airway breathing, circulation, right? Um, um, hemodynamic status, patient's vital signs, fluid electrolytes, glucose, hydration, uh, sleep, right? All of those fall under physiological integrity. So they're always going to be take precedence over anything else. So these are correct answer. Now let's look at our wrong choices. Look at A, 
monitor weight because of malnutrition. Um, with that malnutrition, what are we going to be monitoring, really? Signs and symptoms of infection. When it comes to the patient who is alcohol dependent, they've abused alcohol, they have chronic alcoholism, they're going to be, um, they're going to have nutrition imbalance, right? And so we're going to um, be watching out for signs and symptoms of infection because with that nutrition imbalance, what do you think is going to be low? That vitamin C and what? That protein, both things that are important for wound healing and infection. So um, we're going to be checking for signs and symptoms of infection because of the malnutrition. Okay, so that's wrong. Choice B, give emergency dose of IV magnesium. We would give an emergency dose of IV what? Thiamine. I talked to you guys about that maybe in the first question because they're going to have a serious thiamine deficiency. So we give emergency dose of thiamine as ordered, right? Not magnesium. Um, choice C, decrease pain medication to prevent cross tolerance to opiates. Actually, when it comes to this, we may have to increase it. Yeah, we may have to increase the pain medication to prevent cross um, tolerance to um, opiates. We don't always, but sometimes it is necessary. So the correct answer, guys, is D. During admission to the emergency department, a patient with chronic alcoholism is intoxicated and very disoriented and confused. What drug will the nurse administer first? A, IV thiamine, B, IV benzos, C, IV haldol, or D, IV narcan? I know you guys all got the correct answer. Sorry, I gave you the answer already. The correct answer is A. Uh, a you're going to give that IV thiamine. This helps prevent that encephalopathy and possibly that patient going into psychosis. Okay, so A is the correct answer. Now let's look at the wrong answer choices. Look at B and C. B, IV benzodiazepines, that's a sedative. C, your IV um, haloperidol, that's an antipsychotic. Now these, we absolutely may give it for that um, during the alcohol withdrawal, but it's not going to take precedence over that IV thiamine. Okay, we're going to give that IV thiamine first. And choice D, IV Narcan. Guys, Narcan is an opioid antagonist. So if a patient takes like, has a toxic level of an opioid or they overdosed on an opioid, we'll give that Narcan to reverse it. Is alcohol an opioid? No, so why would we give it for withdrawal? So the correct answer, guy, is, guys, is A. Which question is the best approach by the nurse to assess a newly admitted patient's use of addictive drugs? A, how do you relieve your stress? B, you don't use any illegal drugs, do you? C, which alcohol or recreational drugs do you use? Or D, do you have any addictions we should know about to prevent complications? And guys, the correct answer is C, which alcohol or recreational drugs do you use? This question is a matter of fact, and it really doesn't, <coughs> excuse me, it really doesn't for any like um, judgments, right? You're not making the patient feel as if you're judging them. Remember, we want the patient to be honest so we can help them. Now let's look at the wrong answer choices. One, how do you relieve your stress? That is too broad, right? And we're giving that patient a, uh, an opportunity to lie, to basically, what's that saying you guys say when someone doesn't really want to get straight to the point? Hide behind the bush? Go around the bush? You know what I mean. But you're giving them an opportunity. Tell me in the comments what it is. Is it hide behind the bush or go around the bush? But you're giving them an opportunity to not give you a direct answer. Because if you tell them, what do you do to relieve stress? They can say, oh, well, I like to go on walks. Well, they may like to go on walks, but they may also like to snort cocaine, right? So you don't want to give a and a, you don't want to ask them a question where they can give you such a broad statement or really, you know, go around what you're looking for, which is your answer to your question. So that's false. Go around the bush, hide behind the bush. I don't know. I know, I know it has something to do with the bush, but I forgot what the saying was. All right. B, you don't use any illegal drugs, do you? First of all, that's a closed-ended question. 
Whenever you ask a patient a question where they answer yes or no, that's a closed ended question. And we like to ask open ended questions, right? Um, the only times we really like to ask closed ended questions are when we're doing a quick assessment, like we are rushing that patient to the OR and we need some answers. Um, have you ingested any alcohol within the past 24 hours? Are you allergic to any meds? X, Y, Z, right? Something like that. Or if you suspect abuse, you ask them directly, are you being harmed or injured by anyone? Or you suspect suicide, you ask them directly, you know, are you having any thoughts of harming yourself or someone else? But other than that, you want to ask open-ended questions. That's number one. And number two, when you say which, excuse me, when you say you don't use any illegal drugs, do you? Doesn't that kind of have a judgmental connotation? Even if the person wanted to tell you the truth, after asking them the question like that, they're going to say, no, I don't because they're going to feel ashamed. They're going to feel embarrassed. They're going to feel like they're letting you down, even though you're a complete stranger. So you don't want to say that. Choice D, do you have any addictions we should know about to prevent complication? You see that word addiction? That has a judgmental connotation when you're talking to the patient. So they're going to, they may be embarrassed and they may not want to tell you the truth. That's number one. And number two, again, that's a closed ended question where they just say yes or no. But look at C. You're not giving them an opportunity to kind of whatever it is, hide around the bush, hide behind the bush, go around the bush. You're not giving them an opportunity to do that at all, right? You're asking them in a non-judgmental way, which, which alcohol or recreational drugs do you use? So you're asking them that question with an assumption that most likely they are using something. I just need to know which ones. So C's the best um, answer choice out of the choices that have been given to us. What is the definition of substance abuse? A, a compulsive need to experience pleasure. B, behavior associated with maintaining an addiction. C, absence of a substance that will cause withdrawal symptoms. Or D, overuse and dependence on a substance that negatively affects functioning. And guys, the correct answer is D. It's overuse and dependence on a substance that negatively affects functioning, whether it's psychological functioning, physical uh, functioning, or even social functioning, okay? All types of functioning. Correct answer is D. Now let's look at the wrong answer choices. A, a compulsive need to experience pleasure. That's psychological dependence. B, behavior associated with maintaining addiction. That's addictive behavior. Choice C, absence of a substance will cause withdrawal symptoms. That's a physical dependence. So for our answer, what they're asking us, the correct answer is D. Next question. What term is used to describe a decreased effect of a substance following repeated exposure. A, relapse, B, tolerance, C, abstinence, or D, withdrawal. And guys, the correct answer is B, tolerance. So guys, tolerance is the person having to take more of that substance of chemical just to get the same initial high that they got the first time that they used because their body has gotten used to it. So they need more and more and more and more just to get that initial feeling that they had. That's tolerance. The correct answer is B. Now let's talk about the wrong answer choices. Look at A, a relapse. A relapse is when the person returns to that drug or chemical after they've abstained from it for a certain amount of time. So they've been doing good, they avoided it, they abstained from that chemical, that drug, that substance, and then they went back to it. That's what's known as a relapse. Choice C, abstinence, that's avoidance. That is staying away from that drug or chemical. D, withdrawal. Withdrawal is the body's physical response emotional response, psychological response from 
from abstaining from that medication. It's the patient's response to not having that chemical, not having that drug, not having that substance. So for this question, our correct answer, guys, is B. Next question. On admission to the hospital for a knee replacement, a patient who has smoked 20 years expresses an interest in quitting. What is the best response by the nurse? A, good for you. You should talk to your doctor about that. B, why did you ever start in the first place? It's so hard to quit. C, since you won't be able to smoke while you're in the hospital, just don't start again when you're discharged. Or D, great, I'll help you make a plan and work with your doctor to get you what you need to start while you are here. So the most therapeutic response is gonna be D, guys. Great, you're praising them for making this decision to stop. I'll help you make a plan. You're giving them support and work with your and work with your doctor. So now we're having another healthcare professional on the team to assist you to get you started while you're here. You're not alone. You will have assistance and support in this. And it's a great thing that you're doing this. That is the most therapeutic response. Let's look at the wrong choices. A, good for you. Okay, I'm with it so far. You should talk to your doctor about that. Guys, whenever you refer a patient to go talk to another health care professional about something that you could have educated them on or you could have taught them on, you could have intervened, you could have done something. It was well within your scope of practice, but you passed it on to another health care provider. That's what's known as passing the buck. And you never pass the buck in nursing. The answer choice of passing the buck is always going to be wrong. Okay, unless the question is asking you, which one shouldn't you do? All right, so that's wrong. Choice B, why? Let me stop right there. In nursing, it's never therapeutic to start your question with why or what made you. The fact they started with why, I knew that wasn't the answer choice, so we got rid of that. And then choice C, since you won't be able to smoke in the hospital, look at this, just don't start again when you're discharged. What kind of support is that? What kind of therapeutic communication is that? That is horrible. No, you want that patient to know that they're going to have support in something that's going to be hard. They've been smoking for 20 years. C is the correct answer. What are the physiological effects associated with cocaine and amphetamine? Select all that apply. All right, guys, how do we treat select all that apply as true or false? So um, the way you do it, guys, you go through each answer choice. And if it answers your question, it's true. If it's false, you throw it out. Don't try to group them together. When you try to group them together, that's how you get your answer choices wrong. So we're looking for the physiological effects associated excuse me, with cocaine and amphetamines. A, nasal drowsiness. False. What do we see nasal drowsiness with? We see nasal drowsiness with like sedative hypnotics, right? Not cocaine, amphetamines. No, false. Um, also, um, that drowsiness we can also see with opioids as well. Look at choice B, nasal uh, damage. True. Where will we see that nasal damage when they snort it? True. C, sexual arousal. True. That's a physiological response that we do see with cocaine and amphetamines. What about D, constricted pupils? False. With constricted pupils, you'd see them with like opioids or sedative hypnotics, not with cocaine or amphetamines. Um, e, increased appetite. False. Increased appetite, we see that um, actually with cocaine, we see the opposite, decreased appetite. And so that's why, not now, I don't know about now, but this happened a lot, a lot in the 80s and 90s that we saw like a lot of the supermodels, they would abuse cocaine because it made you skinny because you wouldn't have an appetite. So they wouldn't eat for days. So with cocaine, it actually um, decreases the appetite, not increase. So that's false. <coughs> Excuse me. F, tachycardia with hypertension. True. Remember, we're dealing with uppers. So yes, 
tachycardia hypertension we do see with cocaine or amphetamine so the correct answer guys is b c and f which manifestation is experienced by a patient when withdrawing from sedative hypnotic addiction select all that applies again guys you know we treat select all that applies as true or false let's go a seizures true absolutely and guys this goes across the board for any medications that you know alters you like neurologically or psychologically when that is with when that is um withdrawn especially abruptly it places that patient at risk for seizures true b violence false we see violence in patients who are withdrawing from stimulants c suicidal thoughts false again we see that type of behavior in patients who are withdrawing from stimulants choice d uh tremors and chills false we see that in opioid withdrawal choice e sweating nausea cramps false that also we see in opioid withdrawal so the correct answer for this question is a seizures When the nurse is encouraging a woman who smokes one and a half packs of cigarettes per day to quit with the use of nicotine replacement therapy, the woman asks how nicotine patch in how the nicotine in a patch or gum differs from the nicotine she gets from cigarettes. How should the nurse explain about nicotine replacement? A, it includes a substance that eventually creates an aversion to nicotine. B, it provides non car carcinogenic nicotine unlike the nicotine in cigarettes c it prevents the weight gain that's a concern to women who stop smoking or d it eliminates the thousands of toxic chemicals that are inhaled when smoking and guys the correct answer is d it eliminates the thousands of toxic chemicals that are inhaled when smoking that is the correct answer and something else i didn't mention but you need to know it also de um increases that absorption time so it's not absorbed as quickly into the bloodstream now let's look at the wrong answer choices a it includes a substance that eventually creates an aversion to nicotine that's false no it doesn't choice b it provides a non-carcinogenic nicotine let's stop right there that's the oxymoron. There is no such thing as non-carcinogenic nicotine. Nicotine within itself is carcinogenic. It causes cancer. False. Choice C, it prevents uh, the weight gain that is a concern to women who stop smoking. Nope, that's false. So guys, the correct answer is D. All right, guys, we are down to our last question. Let me know also in the comment section if you'd like me to cover more um substance abuse because there are way more substance uh, um substance questions that i haven't even touched the surface yet so if you'd like to see more of that just let me know in the comment section all right a patient who is a heavy caffeine user has been npo all day in preparation for late afternoon surgery the nurse monitors the patient for effects of caffeine withdrawal that may include a headache b nervousness c mouth tremors or d shortness of breath All right, guys, so the correct answer is a headache. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about this. The patient's a heavy caffeine user. Caffeine is what? A stimulant, right? So this patient's been a heavy caffeine user. They haven't had coffee all day. The most common symptom of coffee withdrawal that we see is headache. A is the correct answer. Choices B, C, and D are absolutely false. Um, I know I said last question, but one more, one more, one more. And this is the last question. All right. The third day after an alcohol-dependent patient was admitted to the hospital for pancreatitis, the nurse determines that the patient is experiencing alcohol withdrawal. What are the signs of withdrawal on which the nurse bases this judgment? Select all that apply. Guys, how do you treat select all that apply as true or false? Let's go. A, apathy. False. Apathy, guys, and when the, is when the patient is just blah. They show 
no interest in anything. They're not concerned about anything. They're not enthusiastic about anything. They're just blah, right? So um, apathy, that is false. With apathy, we see this more when the patient is withdrawing from stimulants, all right? B, seizures. Absolutely true. That patient's at risk for seizures. Now, remember, we're talking about alcohol withdrawal. And again, guys, alcohol withdrawal is deadly. It is lethal. You have to keep an eye on that patient. Choice C, gross motors. Gross motors. <laughs> gross trembles, tremors. They'll start shaking. Absolutely true. You'll see their hand going like this. Korsakoff syndrome. It's a mess. Absolutely true. Um, D, severe depression. False. Um, severe depression, not only depression, what does it say? Severe. Severe depression, we see more in um, the stimulant withdrawal, not alcohol. By the way, guys, you do know alcohol is um, a depressant. I know in the movies, it shows, you know, when the person's drinking alcohol, they're all hype and they're like this, but actually it depresses the system, just so you know. Um, next, cardiovascular co um, collapse. False. Cardiovascular collapse, we see this more when the patient's withdrawing from like sedatives and hypnotics, okay? Choice F, visual and auditory hallucinations true they're seeing things that are not there they're hearing things that are not there right that patient can have alcohol um alcoholic delirium absolutely so the correct answer guys is b seizures c gross tremors and f visual and auditory hallucinations and guys that is it for this video please let me know what you thought about this video in the comment section if you haven't done so already Please don't forget to like this video, subscribe to the channel. I got audio lessons available for you on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. And don't forget to support this channel by also sharing my content on your social media platform. I have questions I cover almost daily on my other social media platforms, such as uh, Facebook, TikTok, and Instagram, so you guys can check me out daily. Thank you so much for watching this video, and you guys will catch me on the next video.